Welcome to Savvy Business, Life Unscripted with your host, Christina Rivera, where our guests share their wisdom and valuable business tips, empowering our audience to expand their personal potential. Hi, Grant McCracken, and welcome to Savvy Broadcasting, Life Unscripted. Uh, we're so grateful to have you here today. You're going to talk about a subject that is very near and dear to a lot of people in the forefront of their mind, whether you're an employee or a business owner, and that is the transformation going across all businesses and, and corporations today, this working from home, this remote, how do we uh, get used to it? What does it look like for the future of America? You're going to share your perspective on that. But before we go there, share with our audience a little bit about your background and uh, where you came from before. Right. Um, thank you, Christina. Great to meet you. Um, I'm an anthropologist, um, and I came up uh, through the University of Chicago just at that moment when anthropology was in a position to study its own culture. So that's what I've been doing for 30 odd years. And uh, when COVID came along, I thought, wow, this is an opportunity. You know, American culture is now a laboratory. This will be a chance to see what happens to the family and to work in this critical time. Yeah. Would you say you're an anthropologist of culture of, of sorts? Yes, exactly. I'm a, technically speaking, a cultural anthropologist. Its culture is always at the center of my, my uh, uh, interest. Now, share for the audience, they're thinking, what exactly does culture mean? Because now more than ever, I'm hearing businesses say, oh, we want to focus on having a good culture. What does right. it mean for a business to have a culture and to yeah. cultivate it? Yeah. Um, there are two, I'm interested in two kinds of culture, the culture inside the corporation, the culture it builds for itself. Uh, and that's, as you say, critically important because it's, it's kind of the navigational device that the organization uses to find its way in the world. And then there's the culture outside the organization. And that's the way Americans think about home and life and work and all of those things. So both of those cultures are changing almost in real time now as the effects of COVID, uh, as COVID transforms us. So, um, yeah, there's a lot on my plate as a cultural anthropologist. What have you observed as some of the greatest changes post-COVID or going through this transition? Right. Um, the big change, I think, well, certainly the corporation, when it sent everybody home, I guess at that point, we all thought, you know, this is a temporary thing. And then it began to dawn on us that it was going to be a long-term uh, proposition. And and uh, we began to see uh, we, we, we saw people kind of obliged to live in the close quarters of their, their homes. Uh, we began, you know, originally we all thought, okay, this is just temporary. And then we began to see that we were in it for a, a pretty long haul, several months. Uh, and now it's been almost five months, I guess. So it's been a tough, uh, it's been a tough adjustments, adjustment in, in both cases. But I think where things get really tricky is when people look at, into the future and they think about going back. I think they have real hesitations about, about that return to the corporation, which just a couple of months ago was the most natural thing in the world for them in their daily life. And then as we got involved in COVID, we thought, well, this is temporary. It's fleeting. None of the things that are happening to me now will continue to happen to me now. And now we're beginning to think, you know what? Some people will never go back to work. Wow. Now, you know, it's interesting. I got both takes of it. Um, having worked from home for a long time, um, and and kind of liking it. I like being in the office. It was kind of I could go there if I wanted or not. Um, but what I found from people who, when they first were told go home, don't come back to the office, I, I had a lot of outrage from coworkers and people I know that were like, no, I, I missed that. I need my fellow coworker and people to connect with. That's right. missing the human right. element. Yeah. Um, and now they're like, nah, I am good with never going back again. It's awesome. Yeah. What what, what happened in those five yeah. months for people to yeah. go from, no, I want to go back to the office too. No, no, I'm good staying here. Yeah. It was weird. You know, I did these interviews with people. Um, an anthropologist t does these ethnographic interviews, and that means getting as close to the individual as I possibly can, listening to what they're saying, getting inside their head and their heart. And it was funny to listen to people talk about their experience of work. You know, there's the strong feeling that in those opening couple of weeks, people now were relieved of the commute to work, which would save them an hour or sometimes two hours a day. They're relieved of all the buffing and polishing that we used to do, hair and makeup and all that stuff, makeup especially for me. And um, <laughs> they, be they began to think, uh, uh, you know, in those opening weeks, they, th they were thrilled to have that time back. And in that early period, I think this was just a windfall gift, right? It was like several hours a day had been given to you, but they didn't really belong to you. They were just a temporary 
temporary kind of condition. But the longer the COVID captivity, let's call it, carried on, the more people began to think, actually, this time belongs to me. It, it never ought to have belonged to the corporation. Now that I'm working from home and I'm getting the job done, I'm not sure that it was ever that commute was necessary, the buffing and polishing was necessary. And then a very interesting idea began to take shape. Some people began to think, so why was I going into work every day? Why was that? It was clearly a habit clearly a standard part of American culture. But now that I look at it, now that I know that it's not necessary, why am I going to, why would I ever think of, of doing it again? And people began to say to me, and I was stunned by this because uh, it never occurred to me to put it this way. They said, you know, maybe going into work is theater. Interesting. Right. Yeah. I thought it, of that myself. Right. You remember that, that moment when we looked at all the security we had to go through at the airport and somebody said, oh, that's just the theater. It really doesn't have anything to do with, with real security. And that's what they're starting to say about work. So I thought, wow, that is, and they were saying it was more than just this was theater. They were saying, listen, what was, was all of that done to flatter the ego of the, the majesty of the corporation? Was it done to flatter the egos of people living in the C-suite? Was this really a gesture of deference that everybody had to give the corporation? Now that we know we can work from home, why would we go back? Why would we surrender those two hours? And, and I think what really made this bite was the sense that people had found this time, they now owned this time, and they, had found, they began to find something to do with this time. Yeah. They began to give it to their families. They began to spend more time with one another. Meal time changed. Family time changed. The relationship, especially between mothers and daughters, changed. Um, and, 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 and so the, the family got richer and denser. You know, mothers used to complain to me that their families felt like uh, train stations, right? Everybody constantly coming and going with relatively little contact between them. But now contact was possible and moms were creating in the middle of that great room that had been sort of the train station for American life. There was now everybody was there. They were there for the duration of the meal. They were there for one meal. Moms were saying, I want everybody to come to the table and have the single meal in a single place, single time, everybody talking together. Now the corporation says, no, you must come back to the the corporation. They go, no, 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 I'm not sure I want to give up the family I managed to create in our COVID captivity. You know what? It seems like it's been a really good thing for building traditional family values back up. Totally. If, wow. if you, yeah, you know, ab absolutely right. That's amazing. Now, here's something I'm hearing from some business owners, though. They're thinking, why am I paying all this money for rent? I mean, no. Honestly, when you begin to realize in the business owner's perspective, there might be some out there in C-suites and yeah. up there in you know, Wall Street going, no, I want my minions here. Um, right. But I'm also getting a lot from business owners yeah. saying, I really like the fact that we're not having to spend whatever for rent. And some of them told me I started to ask for refunds on yeah. you know, whatever, whatever, because it's a vast amount of money spent for keeping the lights on, the computer, yeah. whatever. And so actually it could be a win-win for everyone if it, you are in a position where your business can totally operate sufficiently without having to come into an office. Totally right. I mean, I think there is a theory in the corporate world that says unless people have eye-to-eye, person-to-person -to -person contact, they can't engage in certain kinds of the creativity that are now essential for the well-being of the corporation. So one of the scenarios we're looking at is one that says people will work at home three or four days a week and, and come in one or two days a week. And in that event, the corporation would be in a position to – uh, reduce its footprint in a place like Manhattan by half. You can imagine, we just discovered actually when um, Victoria's Secret was a retail operation and so very expensive, but struggling for lots of reasons. But we just discovered, it was just announced that they were paying a million dollars a month for their space in Manhattan. So, uh, so one glimpse of just how much uh, uh, real estate costs. So um, yes, exactly right. I think it could be a win-win. Now, that, that's great for businesses like that, but it's interesting. One of my um, business uh, I work with, they are actually uh, in the World Trade Center, and oh, they wow. are spending $7 million a month. Wow. Yeah, I mean, they're huge. They're several floors. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm thinking to myself, what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Now, I mean, I, there's something. If you're on the floor of the Wall Street Exchange, maybe you yeah. 
be there, but, uh, but it, it just blew my mind. Now this, what's it going to happen to the other parts of the market? Like say real estate, what's yeah. going to happen when you go to an empty New York city? Yeah. yeah. That's no, a little scary. Yeah. yeah. Well, and when, when we saw people, you know, a million people apparently left Manhattan in those early days and are now distributed across New York state and, mm -hmm. and long Island and, um, some of them will come back and never had any intention of not coming back. But the fear now is that enough of them will stay away, um, that in fact, a crisis will ensue in New York City. And we know what happened in the night. This is one of the scenarios we're watching very carefully. We know what happened in the 1970s, right? When you had people, crime in the city drove people out. They took their taxes with them. Social services diminished as a result of which the city became more dangerous. There was more crime and more people left. And it becomes a downward spiral so there is it's, there's a remote possibility that we could have that kind of um a decentralization of new york city and not just new york city every city could get smaller um but that crime might ensue and some of the the people who are most kind of uh, pessimistic uh, are saying you know listen at some point the government will run out of unemployment money and then you're looking at a city that where you could have a criminal free-for-all which is absolute and that would anybody still there who could leave will leave and then what happens i, I don't mean to be grim no but no but i've been one, thinking that myself have you yeah the rampages of, of rioting across the country which you know is a whole nother thing makes you like i don't yeah. really want to work here anymore or yeah. you know that's one thing for me when i was i recently moved to texas and huh. i was working mostly from home and uh, when they said do you want to come back into the office in any shape or form i'm like no i'm good i'll, I'll just stay here <laughs> there's yeah. riots outside our window so i'll just stay in my apartment <laughs> But it kind of made me want to say, that, you know, I'm kind of like in suburban life. So we're not in right. the city of Houston. We're out actually in Spring, Texas. Right. But uh, it kind of drew me to like, I, I want to be outside of the, you know, yeah. craziness and whatever. So yeah. what do you see as some of the positive things that can come about from all of this? Right. Right. <laughs> um, sure. I mean, you, you, you could say that the corporation could say, I, I get the argument that creativity depends upon eye to eye kind of contact. But it also seems to me you could say, wow, to the extent that people are distributed and living all over the states and phoning it in every day, as it were, the corporation now has a member of the corporation embedded right across the U.S., right? It was a fantastic opportunity, just to the extent that corporations sometimes have a hard time um, not following the captive of their corporate culture, that in, you know, in living in a silo and failing to see how the rest of the world sees the product or the service or the proposition, now that will be easier, right? Because members of the corporation will be living across the states. They'll be out of the silo. They can report home. So that, I think, will be maybe one big benefit. Yeah, yeah. And actually, they'll probably be able to reach markets they hadn't re been able to reach before because they were in the teeny area but, everyone yeah. working in that area now they're spread apart oh here's a possible client we never would have thought to connect with yeah and now we can because we have our, our team spread about so yeah. yeah there's a lot of positivity coming from this and and actually opportunities for businesses and employees alike so uh this has been great but i don't want us to leave without people finding out how they can find out more about you grant McC uh, mccracken how can they do that sure. uh thank you so much uh they could go to uh www culturebuy.com and culture is just c-u-l-t-u-r-e-b-y.com awesome awesome well this has been I a fascinating spell. chat this my pleasure I, I i really know we could go on for hours but this is yeah i would love to <laughs> <laughs> um, but i'm hoping it'll open people's minds and not seeing this is just totally horrible but there can be some wonderful opportunities for everyone listening in whether you're a business owner or an employee um, yeah. that we can get creative and find ways to make this work for all of us. And I thank you so much, Grant, for coming to Stanley my, Broadcasting. My pleasure, Christina. Thank you so much for having me. If you like this episode, please share. To hear more savvy episodes and savvy biz tips, go to lifeunscriptedradio.com. To become a guest or participate in paid sponsorship, email us at christinalifeunscriptedradio.com.